Good morning, everyone. Morning. How are you doing? There's a loud crew over in the corner. I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Send them to jail, Asher says. Wow. It's not very merciful. <clears throat> we don't have a jail at the church, but maybe maybe we could invest in that. <laughs> Be careful, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome Grace Community Chapel. I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad you're online watching us. If you are, we miss your face. Um, whew. Now everybody got quiet. Good, good, good. All right, I'm going to pray, and then I have a few announcements, and we'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day we have here today. We thank you for all the people um, here to worship you and to learn about you and um, just fellowship with each other. We pray that you'll bless our time. And we thank you for the opportunity. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, announcements. If you are sitting in a seat somewhere around you, there is a little white paper. Um, that is a discipleship survey question. We would like you to fill it out. There are pens here. If you don't have a pen, I'm really tempted to throw them at people, but I'm not going to because that seems like a bad idea. Um, but that's just a survey to figure out where we're at um, we're trying to figure out what small groups look like or what ministry looks like going forward. Trying to get some feedback from you guys on what, what you're looking for and what you think you could benefit from the most so we can not prescribe the wrong thing. Like, if you have a broken leg, we don't want to give you a uh, comb. I don't know if the doctors do, but anyway, that was a terrible analogy. <clears throat> anyway, um, that's why I prepare things ahead of time. <laughs> not that. So anyway... Fill that out, get it back to us. You can give it to one of the elders, me, Jeremy, Paul, or you can put it in uh, the box over there with the money. Um, it won't count as money, but it'll be there. All right, so that would be appreciated if you could do that. Uh, second announcement, we have communion today. We have our nifty little convenience communion cups here if you want to come grab one at some point. Um, and then if you want to pick up a pen at the same time you're grabbing a cup, you can do that. That would be like your one-stop shop. You could even use the pen to open the cup. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <clears throat> it might make the wafer taste better. But <laughs> anyway. Um, so, communion today, right after uh, the message wraps up. Third announcement, we have, uh, if you're not aware, we have a church directory starting up in which you have control of what we share. So, uh, the directory can be found on our website. I almost read this. It says, image shown. See, there's an image. It's shown. <clears throat> Let there be image. I'm just kidding. That's not me. Uh, once you sign up, you have to be approved by before you can um, have access. So you can sign up, and then we'll approve you, and then you have access to it. Jeremy will confirm your account when he logs in on Mondays and Fridays. So the control is with him. All right. Last announcement. If you look at the entrance ways in your way out or in, there's this piece of paper for Operation Christmas Child. It is, let's see, I'm going to read it, Cheryl. Uh, form the main entrance and the entry behind sanctuary, um, plus 31 days of prayer. Is that what it's saying? Yeah, there's two different things. Okay, there's two different things, yeah. Pieces of paper for Operation Christmas Child. There's also a sign-up sheet for Collection Week near the coffee bar. You can sign up for that. If you have more questions on that and what that entails, you can talk to Cheryl, and she will give you every detail you ever wanted to know about it. Exactly. So do that. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to say that, Dean. That's mean. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and I think that's all I have for announcements. Wait. Oh, I forgot the one. Pat's waving at me. So next Saturday here at the church, you all know Jerry is, right? Yeah. Used to play drums. We miss him. Um, he's getting married pretty soon um, to a girl named Ruth, so he will no longer be ruthless, which is nice. Right? It's good, right? Come on. Anyway, if you would like to meet Ruth, um, so they're, they're having their wedding at Camp Berea because that's where you meet people. Yeah. Um, a lot of people meet at Camp Berea and get married. Um, I'm one of them. I didn't get married at camp, but... Um, yeah, and it kind of came full circle this weekend, to be honest with you. We dropped Ziva off Friday night for the retreat. Um, so she's old enough to go to camp. 
She was, yeah. So I had this realization dropping her off. Like, she's only a year younger than Melissa was when I met Melissa at camp, um, which is strange. Um, also, Cody asked me, Cody is um, my brother-in-law and also the director of camp. He asked me uh, how I was doing. You know, how how are you doing right now? Is, is, and I was like, I'm fine. Like, the only, like, I don't mind her going. It's fine. What I'm struggling with is I remember being a camper and being a counselor and thinking how old the parents looked when they dropped their kids off. <clears throat> so that's my struggle right now. Okay? So anyway, long story. Um, Jarius is getting married out there. Uh, it's not a big facility, so they had to kind of pick and choose who they invited. So if you didn't get an invite, it wasn't because they don't like you or love you or anything. It's just because camp's a small place and you can't... If you put too many people on that tab, it's going to collapse. That's basically... <laughs> um, so tread lightly, Pat, when you're out there. Um, so there's going to be an event here at church next Saturday from noon to two um, where you can just come and say congratulations um, or I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Don't say that. Um, but you can kind of talk to them and, you know, just wish them well in their marriage endeavor. So... Uh, that's next Saturday here at the church, 12 to 2. Okay? All right. That was a much longer announcement than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Scripture reading this morning is 1 Peter chapter 4. Twelve through nineteen. Make sure I'm in the right Peter here. The first one. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word. Remind you that our tithe and offering box is over there. If you want to give that way, or you can give on our website or anything like that. And join us as we worship him with our singing. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. I've missed seeing everyone. Been very busy with work, but uh, we're here to worship the Lord. And the uh, Holy Spirit has helped us select three or four songs for this morning. So, won't you join us? Stand up. Yes. 
Jesus, Messiah, the one long-awaited Lord of all creation, Lord of all, Jew and Gentile alike, one body in Christ Jesus. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, there is one body, there is one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And in light of that verse, we oftentimes come together and we, we celebrate the other churches in our area that are preaching the gospel. And we pray for them during our worship service because we, they're, they're one with us in the same body, the same Lord, the same Spirit. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you to gather with me together and we're going to pray for these other churches. And if, if uh, standing for a long time, because I know I can sometimes pray for a little bit, if you want to have a seat, you're welcome to do that. And then Ken, I'll have you stand back up for worship. I'll, I'll leave that to you. But let's pray. Father God, I uh, just want to thank you uh, just for the uh, churches, Father, in just the different regions of our state. But uh, specifically, I pray for the churches in Gardner, Maine today, Father. And uh, God, there's more churches we could be praying for, but I think of a couple off the top of my head this morning. And Father, I just want to pray first of all for First Baptist Church of Gardner with Pastor Ken Smith. And Father, I pray you just be with that congregation this morning as they 
I know are gathering at this very same time, and they are worshiping and praising you and learning from your word. Father, we pray that you would just continue to bless that congregation. We pray that you would be worshiped in spirit and truth there. Father, we pray also for Faith Christian Church and Gardner and Pastor Wes Holland. Father, I pray that you would just continue to be with his congregation and the people that meet there. Pray that they would be honoring and glorifying to you this morning and to your son, Jesus. Father, we also want to pray for Life Community Church and and Gardner and uh, Pastor Ramsey Tripp. Father, we just thank you for his faithfulness. And we we pray for his son who's currently in the Ukraine and serving in ministry. Father, we pray you would just be with his family, be with their church. Pray that that worship this morning would be honoring to you. Father, we pray for Winter Street Baptist Church. And Father, you know I had the opportunity to speak with Pastor Terry this last week. And Father, just thankful for that man and his ministry time he's been at Winter Street. And Father, I pray you just bless that body, bless that church. Pray you'd knit them closer together and being more like your son, Jesus. And Father, as the last church I want to pray for this morning, Father, I just want to pray for uh, South Gardner Baptist Church and Pastor Keith. Father, I just pray that you would be with him and, and guard uh, him this morning. And Father, you'd be with the congregation that meets there. Pray that they would also worship you in spirit and truth and that they would be knit together and encourage one another as we ask to do this morning. Father, I pray you'd be with us. Continue to to be with us as we worship you and worship your son, Jesus. Pray that we would be honoring to you and to him this morning. We ask these things in his name. Amen. So someday soon, all of our brothers and sisters will be together, a one body in heaven, united. That's the idea, right? So we're celebrating this now of something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, I think of specifically when Paul is in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about that at some point this perishable will put on the imperishable, that we will eventually rise and become new. So let's gather together and let's sing, Let Us Rise. The next song is called I Will Rise, and it's, it's based uh, on a lot of scripture, but um, it focuses on Psalm 119, verse 62, I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgment. Before 
far stronger. All right, go ahead and be seated. In uh, a world of modern technology, uh, pencils and pens, they make really good uh, styluses. No, actually, I'm a, I'm a kind of guy that likes to write his notes out on, I got like my computer in front of me, but I'm like scratching everything in front of the computer. I, I, I love writing things down. It's just fun. Well, welcome. We are in Acts, and we're going to be in Acts chapter 12 this morning. We are picking up... Uh, kind of continuing our series of life in the church, and what does it look like to be a Christian in the church? About five months ago now, or we finished our series, What is the Church? And now we're kind of getting into, okay, now we know what the church is, but now how does the church live? Uh, and that's what we've been discussing. So we're in Acts chapter 12. Acts is in the New Testament. It is after the gospel, so it's the fifth book in your New Testament. And uh, picking up where we left off, we've, we've had some pretty interesting events occur in the church. Um, one of the most significant recent events is that uh, Gentiles have been included into the church, specifically a man by the name of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, has been adopted into the church prior to him becoming Jewish, as in being circumcised and following all of the law to the letter. And uh, this made quite the commotion in the church, and uh, then we talked about the church in Antioch and how at the church in Antioch they were first called Christians and how that was probably a derogatory term used for people who follow that Christ, that Messiah, Jesus, who the Romans put to death. And so we talked a little bit about that last week. And as we're coming into this week, we're talking about kind of the implications that probably started to happen because Gentiles were being brought in to the church was making a commotion in Jerusalem. And uh, so we're going to be in Acts chapter 12. We're probably going to do all of Acts chapter 12 this morning. Uh, but first, I want to talk a little bit about the person that we see right off the bat as we get into verse 1. It says, And at that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. Now, who is this Herod guy? And uh, if you're familiar with your New Testament, you'll be like, I think there's like five or six Herods, or maybe there's like 40 Seems like there's a lot of different Herods. It's like every time you hear about the name King, it's like King Herod. And you're like, is that the same guy? Uh, no, it's actually not. Um, King Herod that we see in Luke is actually this guy's grandfather. Um, unfortunately, one of the issues in Roman times is that if you wanted to become king, one of the best ways of becoming king was to poison or assassinate the person who currently is king. Uh, and so um, we see that that routinely happening in the first century. Uh, so we're now on to the third King Herod uh, in the New Testament times, and there's going to be one more after, after him, his son, uh, which we won't see until towards the end of Acts. So Herod is kind of an interesting person. Um, he's known as Herod Agrippa, uh, King Herod II, or uh, Agrippa I. And um, this particular Herod, he was, like I said, he was the grandson of Herod the Great. He, Herod the Great being the one that tried to kill Jesus when he was a wee little boy because of some words from the wise men. And uh, according to the first through fourth century sources, Herod Agrippa was quite fond of the Pharisaical tradition. He was following the Pharisees pretty much in the things that they would prescribe. And, and whether it was a ploy for power or he was genuine, uh, people debate all the time, uh, especially within the Jewish community, but Josephus, who's writing in the first century, he, he says this. Uh, he says, concerning Silas and on what account it was that King Agrippa was angry at him. Now Agrippa began to encompass Jerusalem with a wall and what benefits he bestowed on the inhabitants. He, he started building this wall. 
He says, but his, his temper was mild and equally liberal to all men. He was to human, humane to foreigners and made them sensible of his liberality. He was a like manner rather of gentle and compassion temper, uh, which is not what you get when you read verse 1. He also said, Josephus said, accordingly, he loved to live continually at Jerusalem and was careful exactly in his observance of the laws of his country, and therefore he kept himself entirely pure, and nor did a single day pass over his head without an appointed sacrifice. So he would continually go to the temple and offer the appropriate sacrifice of the Gentiles in the temple every day, which is kind of odd for a Gentile, especially a Roman king of a providence, to be doing that. In addition, actually, there is a uh, text in the Mishnah, which is the Hebrew writings post first century, talks about how he would read in the temple the book of Deuteronomy, the book of the law, on special occasions. And uh, so he would come in and he would stand when he would, when he would read, and it wasn't required for him to stand. He just did that as kind of an extra flair. And um, he came at one point, according to the Mishnah, to one passage, Deuteronomy chapter 17, 15, which states this, you uh, may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your own brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. And the Mishnah reports that King Agrippa's eyes filled with tears and because he was not a pure Jewish descent. And the Pharisees quickly said, oh no, King Agrippa, you're our brother, you're our brother. So there's this really unique relationship that King Agrippa has with the Pharisees. And I think that plays in to what we read this morning in Scripture, is that in chapter 12, verse 1, Herod the king lays violent hands on some. Let's continue to read down to verse 5. Starting in verse 2, He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending that after Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made to God by the church. So we see here that Herod Agrippa, he's, he's anxious to please the Jews, whether it's for political reasons, whether it's for power reasons, whatever the reasons is that he decides to kind of get in with the Pharisees, whether it's genuine or not, he, he goes after those Christians and specifically lays hold of James, the brother of John. And it says he kills him by the sword. Now, if you remember, James is the brother of John, and they were called the sons of thunder. Uh, and that is in Mark chapter 10, uh, as well as Mark chapter 2. And if you remember, in Mark chapter 10, verse 35, James and John make a very unusual request to Jesus. And in fact, uh, in another text, it says his mom was there too, and his mom made the request. Uh, they asked that they might sit on Jesus' right and his left hand. And Jesus is like, that's a pretty big request you're making there, and that's not for me to do, it's for the Father to do. And he asks him a question, he says, can you drink the cup that I drink, and can you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they said, yes, we can. They're very presumptuous. <laughs> and, uh, and Jesus says, you're right. And later tradition, as we know, Jesus talks about the cup that he had to drink from the Father, referring to the judgment that he would experience on the cross. Later tradition tells us that since James drank of the cup, and so did John, in judgment, specifically persecution. And so we see here James is drinking the cup that he said that he could drink, and he is killed in persecution. Now, something I think that's interesting is that when the Jews would put uh, someone to death by the sword, it was because they believed that they were pursuing people to, or, or causing people to pursue another god. That's why they would put them to death to the sword. Uh, if you were just making a radical claim, then you would be stoned. Uh, however, if you were putting people out and telling them to go follow other gods, Deuteronomy was to say that you were to be killed by the sword. And that's specifically what's referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 13. We won't look at that this morning. So we see that he's put to death by the sword. And, and I, what I want to read for you now, one more account, last, last history. I know I like my history, but it's, it's cool because it sets the context. It helps you see what's going on. 
Uh, this, is, uh, this is a writer writing in the third century. His name's Eusebius. Uh, if you've never heard of him or you've never read his book, it's very interesting. Um, but Eusebius writes in the third century, and he writes specifically about this, and he gives us some details. And he says, about this time, uh, manifested during the reign of Claudius, Herod the king prepared to afflict some of the church, but he slew James, the brother of John, with the sword. Of James, Clement added a noteworthy narrative in the seventh book of his institutions. That's a book we no longer have. Uh, evidently recording it according to the tradition he received from his ancestors. He said that the man who led James to his judgment seat, moved by the way that James bore his testimony to the faith, confessed himself a Christian. Both, therefore, said he, were led away to die. On their way, he entreated James to be forgiven of him. And James considered a little reply, peace be unto you, and kissed him. And they were both beheaded at the same time. So according to church tradition, and according to a writing from the first century, which we no longer have, James, on the traveling to going to his death, the executioner was there talking to James, and the executioner was convicted believed in Jesus Christ, and went to the block with him. Now, that, that's the kind of story I think that's kind of cool, right? Even, even in this horrible situation, people are being brought to new faith. But either way, he killed James. And it says that it's, Herod saw that it pleased the Jews in verse 3. And it seems like he seems to be very interested, in, and I like how Luke puts it, it's almost like he's trying to give us the indication that Herod's trying to please the Jews. It's what he's after. He wants them to like him. And uh, if you know anything about Roman history, he recently has a good friend in Caligula, who's the current emperor. But the previous emperor had put him in chains in prison. Uh, and so um, Herod is anxious to make sure he makes friends wherever he is uh, because he's trying to keep himself back from where he was, which was in prison in Rome. And so um, he delivers him over to four squads of soldiers, uh, uh, specifically Peter. So he sees that uh, James is, is excited, that their Jews are excited they killed James. So he grabs Peter, and he's like, ha James is good, one of the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder, but I've got Peter, right? And he's like, I'm going to kill him. Now, he can't kill him because it's Passover, feast of unleavened bread. And according to the Jewish tradition, no one can be put to death. So again, Herod is trying to follow after the Pharisees, trying to follow the ruling of the Jews, and he doesn't put Peter to death, but instead puts him in prison. It says that uh, specifically he had four squads of soldiers, that's four in each squad, that's 16 soldiers that guarded Peter. He intends to keep him here in prison until after the Passover. So he puts him in this prison, and uh, we f further learn that in verse 6, which we'll get there in a minute, but Peter was sleeping between two soldiers and he was chained to them. So he had two soldiers, one on either side of him that was chained to him, each of his hands. And it seems like there was an iron door, and then there was a couple sentries outside as well as some patrolling in the area. There are a lot of soldiers guarding Peter. He's also outside the city. So we've got this large Roman guard keeping Peter until soon when Herod can present him before all the Jews who have come due to Passover, if you remember, Passover is when a whole bunch of Jews from all over the territory come into Jerusalem. So this is a big show that Herod's going to be putting on, killing Peter. And he's probably excited about it. Verse 5 says, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer was made for him, uh, was made to God by the church for him. Now, I have to ask you a question this morning. Do you think earnest prayer was made for James? Do you think earnest prayer was made for James? What, if it was, was, it because, was James killed because the church didn't ask enough? Was James killed because the church did something wrong in their ask? How about something more, a little more applicable uh, for you and me? Uh, when our prayers aren't answered or when your prayers are not answered, is it because you did something wrong? There are times when we look at the circumstances around us and we, cannot, we can't possibly think uh, why things went the way that they did. I, think about this. John is probably in this group praying. His brother has just been killed. 
right? And these two, they weren't just like, hey, we grew up together and then we went our separate lives. I lived in Maine, you live in wherever, right? This, that's not how this was. They were working together. They were fishermen on a boat together. They spent every waking day with each other. In fact, anytime you read the Gospels account, you don't see one without the other. The sons of Zebedee. It's always the sons of Zebedee. It's always the two of them. They're like peanut butter and jelly, or up here, peanut butter and fluff. Apparently that's more of a thing. They were always together. But now his brother's dead. How does he feel? And, oh, by the way, add on top of that, who else was always with the sons of Zebedee? Peter. He worked with them. And anywhere there was times there's, you know, the sons of Zebedee and Peter. Who were the three? Peter, James, and John. James is dead. Peter's captured, awaiting death. That's the way it is. That's what they know. So they're praying. Contrary to what is preached by some, prayer is not about getting God to change the circumstances to bless you. It's not what it's about. Brothers and sisters, there's something you must understand this morning about prayer. Uh, prayer is not making an attempt via control over the Lord of the universe. We don't pray to God to say, well, if I do this, then you have to. That's not what prayer is for. Prayer is instead the ultimate admission that we are not in control, and it's aimed at a transformational surrender. It's interesting that uh, in praying the prayer that the Lord provided to the disciples in Matthew chapter 6, there's this element that says, your will be done. It's not about praying that God gets his way. It's about people living in the way that God has prescribed. And about us living in the way that God has commanded us. That's what it's about. His people living in obedience to the providence that God has revealed in the circumstances of our lives, that we may obey the mandates of God, regardless of the circumstances which we've been placed in. So that makes us ask the question, does prayer really change anything? Does prayer really change anything? As we're going to see, God answers the prayers of the church and rescues Peter. I like how R.C. Uh, Sproul puts it in his little book and, uh, about does prayer change things, and this is what he says. This is referring to a time he was asked the question, uh, does, God, uh, does prayer change God's mind? R.C. Sproul says, my answer brought a storm of protest because I simply said no. He says, but, now if the person would have asked me, does, God, does prayer change things, I would have answered yes. That God, through his divine providence, uses the prayers that we pray in our lives to change circumstances in the lives of his people. He goes on to describe that there are things that God has decreed from all of eternity that will come to pass. If every believer in God in the first century when they were walking with Jesus prayed that Jesus wouldn't die on the cross, it wouldn't have changed anything. And if all of us gather together with every other Christian in the world and pray that Jesus doesn't come back, he's still going to come back. It's not going to change anything. There are things that are guaranteed, that are sure, that God has set from the foundation of the world that will not change. To double down on this idea, didn't Jesus himself pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, let this cup pass from me? If Jesus prayed for something and it didn't come to pass, it, there are going to be times that we're going to pray for things that don't come to pass because it's not God's will. And he has a better plan. Jesus, ultimately recognizing that will, submitted himself to obedience. And in Matthew chapter 26, he says to Peter, he says, shall I not submit to the cup that the Lord has given me, that my Father has given unto me? As Peter takes out his sword and is good and ready to cut off people's ears, he didn't have very good aim. Uh, a fisherman, not, not a warrior. Um, Jesus says, put it away. I'm going I'm to take the cup that God has given me. So how do we respond? How do we respond when our prayers are not answered? 
Uh, first, we must not accuse those who have not received healing, restoration, or blessing that it is due to their lack of faith. That's the first thing we need to do. We don't need to look at somebody and say, well, if you just would have had more faith, then it would have come to pass. Because that's not true, beloved. That's not true. Otherwise, you could say, if Jesus would have just had more faith. A simplistic reading, carving out a few scriptures and dismissing the rest has resulted in destructive and a devilish theology of prayer that assumes that prayer is a magical incantation when done right gives us the reins of the Lord of the universe. That's not what prayer is. Invoking Jesus' name does not bind him to our words. Christians, if this is your thinking today, I'm going to ask you to repent and ask forgiveness from God, who will grant it, and I'm also going to ask you to go to those who you may have hurt in speaking those things and ask them for forgiveness. Secondly, we must rely on what God has promised and what God has not promised. We have to pray recognizing what God has said. And if we've asked for something, we have to recognize, did God promise this thing? doesn't mean that we can't ask for it. But if our answer comes back and it's not the answer we were hoping for, or we feel like it's not answered at all, how do we respond? Well, God has not promised wealth, health, and the fact that we won't suffer. For the last thing, actually, he promises that we will suffer. I brought a number of books with me down here. You can't see them right now because I hid them. There's a number of them. There's a lot of them. I got a lot of books. These are all dealing about martyrs. I've got devotional books. I've got books that are 40 days long telling you about different persecuted Christians. I've even got, I've even got a couple copies of the Fox's Book of Martyrs. Okay? This is like everybody who's died from the Christian faith that we that we know about that's significant enough to report in a book. Okay, well, there's, there's a lot of people, but hey, come up, take one. They're free. At the end of the service, grab, grab one, take it. And if you want to donate something to, for thanks, send it to the Voice of Martyrs. There have been people that have suffered throughout all of Christianity for the past 2,000 years. And for us to be upset about the suffering that we encounter is not fair to them. And it's not fair to the truth of what Scripture says. So, claim the real promises. One, don't, don't, don't speak about not having faith. Three, continue to ask and adjust our seeking so that we're transforming, we're transforming ourselves and the Spirit is transforming us through our prayer requests. So as we ask, and we see that God is not answering. We're just providing an answer we didn't expect. We, we, we move our prayer and adjust our prayer to pray what God would will. We want our prayer requests to reflect God's will, not selfish ambition or vain conceit. And I'll tell you, I don't like to suffer. And if I, if I knew that praying every day, saying God don't let me suffer would work, I would probably do it. Now I know that scripture says suffering produces character, but I don't want it that bad. <laughs> but that's, that's not how it works. That's not how it works in the first century, and that's not how it works today. To pray in Jesus' name is to pray that whatever we ask would be in his will, and that it not, if it not be in his will, that he can form our thinking to his. Then we thank him and we praise him for the areas where he see his providential provision. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says this, and, and 16, he says, Since we have a high, great high priest who is passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. So let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. If Jesus experienced suffering and he experienced horrendous things, then we can expect we may. But when we go to him in prayer, he understands. He understands what it is to be weak. He understands when you're tired and you're just done with it. And you're ready to give up, he gets it. He didn't give up, but he understands how you feel. 
So, James is killed. The church is praying. They're earnestly praying. Let's keep reading. Acts chapter 12, verse 6. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, and behold, (laughs) an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him and said, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off of his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and he followed him. And he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard and came to the iron gate leading into the city, it opened for them on its own accord. And they went out and went along the street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. Interesting, huh? Now, you might be surprised. Why did Peter think it was a vision? Well, he just recently had a vision. If you remember the sheet coming down from heaven and tons of food in there that he was like, I'm not supposed to eat, but I'm hungry, right? So he's probably thinking, oh, another vision. I'm supposed to learn something from this and supposed to glean something from what God wants to tell me about this. Um, all of a sudden, he's on the street, angel's gone, and he's like, wait, well, that actually all happened? Pretty significant. It says that uh, he was in the prison. Obviously, Herod was intending to bring him out that very next day. So this is right at the end of Passover, right when Herod's planning on bringing him out the next day to off with his head. So Peter was sleeping. I think that's interesting. It says in verse 6 that Peter was sleeping. So either it was from exhaustion or from the acceptance of his fate. Regardless of what it was, either way, he was, he was at rest. He was going to let it be. He had no idea what it was God had in store for him. And so ultimately, he was just resting in confidence that whatever God brought, he brought. So we have these soldiers that were guarding him. They were chained to each of his sides. The door's closed. He's got sentries outside the door. And he's outside the city. And it says, and behold. This verse basically says, hey, pay attention, reader. Pay attention. (laughs) Something happened. And it says that the angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone about in the cell. Uh, Luke declares the next thing that Peter remembers. Peter basically remembers getting shook awake And there's this angel standing there, and there's this light in the cell, and he's like, oh, a vision, either a dream or something. And he's told to get up quickly. The angel doesn't waste any time. Get up quickly. Chains fell off. Told to get up with haste. I find it interesting, the angel tells him to dress yourself, put on your sandals, and wrap a cloak around you. It's kind of interesting things for the angel to say. Now, if you remember, this isn't the first time that Peter has escaped prison miraculously. In Acts chapter 5, uh, the angels come to him and, and John, and they bring him out of prison because the Jewish people put them in prison, and they're told to go back to the temple and keep preaching. Right? And now, though, the angel comes and gets him, tells him to wrap a cloak around himself, put on his sandals, and make haste. A little bit of a different situation here. Ultimately, Peter wasn't done. God still had a mission for him on earth for the church. Now, we know, according to tradition, that Peter would die later on by Nero's hand. And ultimately, he'd be crucified upside down, according to church tradition. But that wasn't today. That wasn't the time. Not in God's plan. So he thought all of this was a vision, and he, you know, I could just see him kind of dazed, like, okay, put on sandals, cloak, okay, what's next, Lord? You know, like, oh, go through the door. Gets up to the city gate, and these gates, these are like, these are gates that are shut, okay? Uh, so that people can't get in in the night, you can't have people trickling into the city, uh, anything like that, they're shut. Uh, and it says that the door automatically opened. Now, I don't know if he was a fan of Star Wars or not, but I don't know if he like, did like the whole like with the hand thing. You know, <laughs> some of you might have done when the automatic doors happen. So th- th- this, is, this is what happens. The door automatically opens. This first automatic door. Uh, I don't know if this is how they got the idea or not, but, uh, you know, first automatic door just opens right up. He walks right in. And it says that he was 
rescued from the hand of Herod and from the Jews. Peter knew what was going to happen. He knew what the plan was. And he knew he was going to be killed. But it wasn't time yet. Verse 12. Let's keep reading. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked on the door of the gateway, the servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice and her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and, she kept say, and they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said to them, tell these things to James. That's not the James who was killed. It's the other James. And the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. Let's pause there. So Peter goes to where he knows there's going to be prayer happening. Okay, Mary's house. This is this, the mother of John Mark, who later on would be in a missionary journey. Um, and they go up, probably Barnabas is on. Uh, they go up and there's an outer gate. The fact that there's an outer gate in this house, she's wealthy. She lives in the upper quarter. And so there's this outer gate, and there's a servant girl, and the servant girl goes up and hears Peter's voice. Obviously, she knows Peter's voice. Peter preaches a lot, okay? So she probably knows his voice pretty well. Hears his voice and is surprised, so shocked, she just, she just leaves him outside. And that sounds like something people would do when they're surprised. I don't know if you've ever been surprised by something and then you did something completely blockheaded. Like, you're like, wow, I just, you know, I, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't thinking. So she runs in and tells everyone, he's here. And they're like, okay, servant girl, Rhoda, no, he's not here. It's, it's not a thing. God doesn't answer prayer like that. It, it doesn't, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. This is the first century. We're talking about people being healed by shadows in the first century. Right? This is, this is, is it, but, they're, but they're like, that's not going to happen. After B, James being killed, I wonder if some of them doubted. I wonder if some of them doubted and just kind of had resolved themselves that Peter's going to die. But the reality is, is that God does answer prayer. He does respond. So she's insistent. No, really, it is Peter. It is really Peter. And I don't know why she just didn't run back out to the gate and just open the gate and bring him in, but like she just had to insist. Like, no, I, I'm telling the truth. But they don't, they don't believe her. And uh, it, they make a couple interesting comments. Uh, we won't spend too much time on it this morning. Um, but they, they kept saying, it's his angel. Now, th- there, there was a belief in the first century of the Jews. And uh, notice it says, perhaps it was his angel. Uh, there's kind of this idea that it, it might be. They don't know. Um, but there's this idea that everyone has a guardian angel. And that came from the first century Jews. That's where that idea came from. Uh, some people still hold on to that tradition today. And they think that's true. I'm not here to tell you it's not or it is. um, But that's what they may be referencing specifically there. Verse 16 tells us that Peter kept knocking. He's like, no, 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 I want to come in. I don't know if like part of him's like, God, you're going to have to rescue me again because now they're going to catch me on the street. Uh, like, Like he just escaped prison, right? He just escaped from these guards miraculously. Now in the city, he's probably like, I really want to come in from outside. Um, I don't want people to catch me. Um, so anyways, he's, he's continually knocking, and they finally opened it, and it says that they were amazed. Uh, verse 17 is interesting. He motions to them with their hand to be silent. I think there was like just this eruption of excitement. Right? He's like, shh, <laughs> like, don't wake everybody else up. Um, I have to get out of here. And that's kind of the idea that seems to be communicated by the angel telling him to wear a cloak. All of this has kind of convinced Peter it's time for him to leave Jerusalem for a time. And so he will be doing that. And uh, I think sometimes God surprises us when prayers are answered. And I, I can tell you, at Wednesday night prayer group, we, we routinely pray for things. And I, and I can tell you that I've seen a number of times where those prayer requests have come, come to pass. And um, I think sometimes it's really easy for us to overlook when God answers prayer. I mean, this one was kind of hard <laughs> to overlook. But I think sometimes we have a tendency to do that. And sometimes it's because I pray for something like finding my car keys. Yes. That I'm just like, I lost my car keys. I need to be at some place in such and such time. God, would you just help me? And then like seconds later, I find it. And I'm like, oh good, it was right where I knew it was all along. 
And then I just don't even think about it. Right? I just like, oh, OK, of course, I found it. Right? Or, or, you know, maybe it's more significant. Maybe someone you've been praying for for a while, rather than the prayer not being answered, it has been answered, and, and someone's healed in a way that you're like, wow, that's, that's incredible. We were talking this morning about Mary Small. Someone who's gone through, what, four surgeries? And now coming home. That, that's, it's huge. And we've been praying for her. And it would be a shame for us to overlook when God answers through his provision and not thank him for that. We should always be thankful when God answers prayer. And that should be our response is offer up praise to him. Now, God has total providence over the affairs of human life in his church. Let's keep reading verse 18. Now, when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Shocker. And, he, and Herod searched for him and did not find him. And he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Let's keep reading. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastius, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended upon the king's country for food. And on the appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes and took seat on the throne and delivered an or- oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give glory to God and was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Verse 24 says, but the word of God increased and multiplied. Something I find interesting here is that obviously in verse 18, there was no little disturbance. When you wake up in the morning and you go to get Peter and the guys who were chained to him are like, yeah, we've, we've been looking for him all morning. We don't know where he went. Like, he was chained to us, but now he's gone. The doors barred, but they were opened. We don't understand. I think about it with, like, the Jews, right? Like, the Jews, when Jesus was not in the tomb, and they're like, well, there must be some reason. Well, that's what Herod's doing, right? The, the, the irrationality of the fact that this would occur, he's like, well, I guess one of you must be a turncoat. And he questions them brings them as a tribunal and says, one of you must have helped. And because he can't figure it out, he kills them all. Not a very friendly man, per se. Um, Then it says he went down to Judea to Caesarea and spent some time there. Now, Herod is pursuing Christians fervently. He wants them dead because he wants to please the Jews. So Peter's not safe. Now, the Jews have been pursuing the Christians for a while, but they don't have government authority like Herod does. And if Herod decides, I want to kill the Christians, he has every right to do so, unless they appeal to Caesar, which, frankly, they weren't going to get that appeal. So, Herod's a problem for the church. And yet, he goes down to Caesarea to talk to some folks. Josephus actually records this very same event. First century, Jewish person, doesn't believe in Jesus, not a Christian. He records this and says this occurs. Puts on, he says he puts on these really fantastic, beautiful robes, stands up before the people in Caesarea, and, and before the game, sits on his throne, and then stands up, and he, and he starts delivering a speech. And the people all cry out. The very same thing Josephus says, the very same thing. Voice of, of a God and not a man. Voice of a God and not a man. And Josephus records that, unfortunately, Herod went, yes, 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 I know, I know. And it says, Josephus records that he immediately was struck ill. And he doubled over, and he had pains in his stomach and in his heart. And they rushed him away. And it says that five days later, he died. But Herod knew he was going to die that day. That's what is recorded. Now, the idea here specific in scripture is that he suddenly died, not that he died that second, okay? Immediately is the idea of suddenly. Herod was fine. He was super healthy, okay? He, he was actually well known for being healthy. He was a really great hunter. But he died like that. And he became immediately ill after the events that occurred. So that is a non Christian, non-biblical source that confirms what's said here. 
Because guess what? It's inspired, it's true. And can I tell you something? Herod's death brought about peace again for the Christians. And it says, verse 24, the word of God increased and multiplied. God, through his providence, although James has been killed, which brought about the salvation possibly of people that could not have been saved otherwise, Peter is rescued, and now Herod is dead. God is sovereign over everything, including his church. If you remember the last time believers gathered together praying, don't forget their words. In Acts chapter 4, verse 27 through 28, they say, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod, that was the previous Herod, and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God is not surprised. He's not shocked. He's not unaware. Turn one more place to me. First Peter. This is where we're going to close. First Peter. Chapter 4. It's read this morning. First Peter. First Peter is towards the end of the scriptures. It's right before you get um, to after James, after Hebrews. James, the half-brother of Jesus, not the James that was just killed. First Peter, chapter 4. Let's look at verses 12 through 19 again. I'm going to read it for you, and I'm going to offer you four things that Peter says. Beloved, do not be surprised at a fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as far as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of the glory and the God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, then what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let us or let those who suffer according to God's will and trust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. First off, Peter says the first thing is don't be surprised. Don't act like suffering is strange because it's not. It happened to Christ, happened to our brothers and sisters across the ages. Why shouldn't it happen to me? Why shouldn't it happen to you? Peter also says, rejoice and do not be ashamed in suffering. Why would you be ashamed in suffering? Well, it's sometimes suffering can bring you shame. People can treat you shamefully. But rejoice in it because you are sharing in Christ's shame. Therefore, you will share in his glory. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs of Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The third thing Peter says is suffering for Christ is not of your own attitude or not for your own attitude or sin judgment. Ultimately, don't suffer for your sin, suffer for Christ. And oftentimes we suffer for our sin and we go, oh, I'm suffering. It's like, no, you made bad decisions and this is the consequence of those decisions. And in those times, that's not your suffering for Christ, that's it's you suffering for your sin. And that's what Peter is saying, is don't, don't suffer for those things that are your sin, but instead suffer uh, for righteousness' sake. And that judgment's going to start with us. And if God's going to judge us for sin, he's certainly going to judge those apart from him for sin. Think about the two people who were under judgment died this morning in the passage. We have James. He died in judgment, ultimately, from Herod, that he was a faithful servant of his master who entered into the rest of his savior. And then we have Herod, Agrippa, the king, who was judged on the basis of his sin and now awaits final judgment in hellfire. Two men, both died. One to peace, one to torment. Peter concludes that those who suffer 
do so according to the will of God. That's the fourth thing. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will. So if you want to know what the God's will is for you, it's to suffer. That's a hard thing to realize, but that's the truth. But we suffer as not with those without hope, because as we suffer, we recognize this is temporary. This is temporary. Therefore, because we may suffer, in that case, we should act like Peter and James did in Acts chapter 12. And we should entrust our souls in a faithful creator and continue to do good. Let's pray. Father God, I don't always know why you provide suffering in our lives, but you do it. And so, Father, I, I pray that for those here this morning that are suffering, Father, I pray that, um, Father, I pray for, for peace in their suffering. And Father, for many of them, I pray that, that suffering may end because, Father, we don't want to suffer all the time. Father, I know there are people this morning who are suffering from health issues. There are people suffering from emotional issues. There are people suffering from, from family f- frustrations. And there are people who are suffering from feeling alone. Father, there are people who are suffering from still struggling in the pandemic. And Father, I, I pray for all of those people who are suffering. Father, I pray that uh, you would bring about your peace in their lives. Father, that they would be able to continue in their path and continue to do good before you, trusting you as a faithful creator. Father, I pray that as we pray to you, that we would be reminded of why we pray and, and who you are in our prayers, that we might pray in your promises, that we might honor you through our prayers, that we might not... Uh, be disappointed when you don't answer our prayers the way that we want you to, but that we would be reminded that you are a faithful creator doing good and shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Father, we ask these things in the name of your son Jesus, who suffered on our part. We ask these in his name. Amen. We're going to have our communion service, and then we'll sing a song. If you've not yet got a cup and you'd like to get a cup, now is the time. And if I could have uh, Ben come up. Yeah. I'd ask for all of our elders, but the other elders serving in nursery, so. He's having fun. (laughs) I promise. (laughs) So, in case you need it for prayer. Um. Why do we do communion? We've we talked about this before. And I'm not going to go into another sermon. You don't need that. You already got one. It's not two for one day. But why do we do communion? The answer is because we're remembering the sacrifice of Christ. That's what we're doing. We're, we're gathering together and we're saying, if we partake of this, we're saying, yeah, yeah, I'm part of this. I'm part of this body. I'm part of his body. I'm identifying myself with Jesus. It's interesting, in the first century, uh, they would offer a pinch of incense on the altar for Caesar. And Christians wouldn't do that because they they had their own commemorative thing for their king. And that's communion. And they would do that regularly. And it's been done for 2,000 years regularly. And we're joining in that tradition of remembering what Christ has done on the cross for our sins. And so when we take the bread and we take the cup, we are remembering Christ's body and his blood. So first, we take the bread. The bread is a symbol of Christ's body. He was broken for us. He was broken for our sins. And he paid the penalty on our behalf. And that is what the bread is for. Ben, would you pray for the the bread? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. We thank you for his body and for being willing to sacrifice him for us. Um, 
We thank you for an, such a pure example of love. And uh, we just pray that we can remember that as we take this bread and throughout our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Paul says the tradition that was handed down to him, he hands down to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11. And that tradition is that when Christ took the bread, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Do so in remembrance of me. Take it and eat. Paul continues and says, in the same manner, he took the cup. And Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That's, that's what it is. The idea is that the body is broken for our sin. And the cup is to remind us that we are now in a new covenant. God says, I will put my spirit in you. I will change your heart, take out the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Put my law upon your hearts and you will be my people and I will be your God. And beloved, we're grafted in. We're joined in on that, that promise. And what we do this morning in, in drinking the cup, we're celebrating that we're part of that. We're, Jesus says, I won't drink of the cup again until I drink it anew with you in my kingdom. And when we drink the cup, we're reminding, yes, Jesus, I know that you're waiting. I know that you're waiting for us. So let us drink in remembrance of him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your son. Thank you for the new covenant that we have in his blood. I thank you for the reminder that Jesus has purchased a way for us. Father, I pray that we'd be faithful to him. Father, I pray that we'd be reminded of his sacrifice today. We ask these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Have the worship team come up. Thanks for explaining why, why all the books were up here, Jeremy. Won't you join us? Never end. You're the only 
God who's worthy of everything we can give. You are God. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. times and bad. You are on your throne. You are God alone. You're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. That's what you are. You're unchangeable. You're unshakable. You're unstoppable. time began. You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. Father God, we are deeply touched by your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for this time together and for the ability to share your holy word. Throughout this week, help us to be faithful to you and multiply your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. Mm -hmm.